All right, everyone. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and thank you so much for joining me for today's Friday Masterclass, where today we are in part three of um, Premiere Pro Basics, and today we're going to be focusing on fixing common video and audio issues that many, if not all of you, all of us, everyone, has run into at some point in time. And this can be anything from the very basics of you know, you're shooting on, we're all shooting with digital cameras. So sometimes you're shooting something, maybe it just has a bit of a digital edge. It's just not, it's just, it's, it's sharp, it's saturated, it's contrasty, but it's, it's just too much. You want to take that edge off, talk about how to do that. What if you're shooting stuff all handheld as I do, never use a gimbal, never use any kind of, you know, external stabilization. So it has a bit of that, you know, handheld wonkiness talk to you about, about how to fix that, as well as some other things like lens correction. And then we'll get into some audio stuff towards the end around fixing, um, you know, basic techniques for removing noise or, or minimizing noise, or even minimizing echo and reflection, as well as one of the most common things that people run into, which are uh, clipped sections and distorted sections in audio. So I'm going to show you real briefly how to do that. Lots of stuff to cover. So this is, in fact, the... Um, the uh, the lineup for today. Sorry, it took a second there to, uh, to start happening. So yeah, smoothing digital edginess, fixing handheld shaky video, correcting lens distortions, sky replacement with HSL. That's very, very cool. And hopefully we get to that. And I can get to show you that. And then all the audio stuff that we just talked about. So once again, I want to point out that I am following the live chat over at uh, b.net slash Adobe Live. So uh, if you're on my channel or elsewhere, if you want my want me to see your comments live, this is where you want to be. Otherwise, I'll go back to my channel at the end and answer them as many as I can. And if you're on Twitter watching, thank you so much for joining. Uh, great to see you all and great to see everyone who's joining in on Adobe Live, Behance, and YouTube as well. Okay, so just a couple of quick shouts before we get started. Looks like we've got a good crowd today. <laughs> Brian Shackelford, welcome to Mr. Jason's Neighborhood. I'll go ahead and put on my... Uh, my red sweater for you there. What's up, uh, Reverb Mike? Dude, Windy Mics. Oh yes. Now I'm not. I'm not covering that today. Sometimes I bring in wind stuff. Maybe if we have time at the end. I don't know if we will. Uh, we can talk about it though. And if you have questions around it, I'm certainly happy to answer it. You've probably been in many of those sessions where I've shown it before. Anyway, Eve Loria, hello, Bruce Gonzalez. Very nice to see you, Ferry. Juan, great to see you too, and George, Umicorn as always, Cody Bear, Jose, Rick Adams, Mustafa, Jan, Steve. All right, great to see you all. Thank you so much for joining. And we've got Deepak from India and Shandan. We enjoy every day. It's been a while. How are, how are you doing? All right, great to see you. Okay. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Let me go ahead and switch my screen over here. And it looks like everything is running as it should. So I'm just going to go over to Premiere and uh, let's kick right in because my goodness, there are many things we're going to cover today. All right. So um, first, just as a, as a, as a soft start, <laughs> before we get into anything heavy, um, let's talk about, you know, when we're shooting like with our phone or, you know, mobile devices. Okay. Now, obviously, if you're shooting with a mirrorless or DSLR, some of that digital edginess that I was referring to earlier is, is maybe a little less apparent because like I shoot with a Nikon D850, you know, beautiful glass. It's an amazing camera, super high bitrate media. Um, I never encounter edginess there. And also I very commonly always will shoot completely desaturated, you know, lower the contrast, um, really flatten things out so that I can bring back in the color and the detail later. Now here I've got some footage, which I've shown on stream before. Uh, this is just some iPhone content that I shot in my front yard here. And uh, while I was very happy to capture that lovely rainbow following a monsoon, um, you know, if you look at the at the footage, first of all, if you're looking over at the scopes on the left, you can see that, you know, again, it's not <laughs> it's not perfectly exposed. We've got the highlights quite a bit blown out in some sections, all right, re represented here. And then we've also got, some loss of, you know, just shadow detail because things are really just going into the black. We have a, what you call crushed blacks where it's just, you know, it goes, there's no gradient. It's just full black. There's no detail, nothing. And it's, it just, on top of that, if I were to zoom in here, I don't know how well this is coming across on the stream, but it just kind of has that edginess 
It was just this digital sharpness that, you know, is great. You know, it's nice to be sharp, but at the same time, it just it just has an edge that I don't like. And I just want to smooth that out. So there's a lot of different ways that we can do this. Just to show you real quickly a couple of ways that you can do that using the basic corrections panel and creative LUTs or lookup tables or looks, however you want to refer to them. Okay. So first, let's talk about using a LUT or a look. All right. So if we go into the creative section here, and this is kind of a quick one click fix, all right, or a one click attempt at fixing, I should say. If you just want to give, you know, your digital footage kind of a, a more film like aesthetic, well, if you happen to see at the top of the menu here under creative, we have these looks. And the first uh, half a dozen or so here um, all say like Fuji, Eterna, something, Fu Fuji, Kodak, Fuji, Kodak, 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 Fuji. What this is representing is it's telling you this is simulating shot on Fuji, Eterna, processed on Kodak. So these are film stock emulations, okay? Film stock LUTs. And these are going to instantly kind of change the feel of your video content. Now, they may be too much. They may be not what you're looking for. They may affect the color or the tone in a way that you don't want. But just by kind of auditioning these, you're going to get a very different feel. So let's go ahead and start with the first one. Now I can click through them here. You'll notice when you go into the menu, you have these little arrows. So I can cycle through the different looks and LUTs. And when I find one that I like, I can simply click and it applies it. Now, again, right away, that's kind of a little too intense. Now, we do have an intensity slider here, which you can adjust. But I can tell this one, this isn't going to do it for me. Let's go to something else. I want to kind of lower that contrast and give me a more film-like look. Let's take a look at this one, Fuji F125 Kodak 2395. And right away, if you're paying attention to the scopes, notice that we've now brought back some of that shadow detail, right? We're no longer clipping in the black range now. We actually have more of a of a of a of a of a gradient going into black into those shadows. Just an infinite amount of more detail in the shadows. All right. And again, you can continue to adjust the intensity of that LUT, right? And you can see how it's affecting the overall shot, the overall hue and brightness. Uh, and contrast of this as well. If we cycle through a couple of others here, this one also adds a bit of a slight temperature shift. All right, now we've lost a little bit of the shadow detail there, uh, maybe uh, kind of accentuated some of the highlights. Again, you have other methods here that you can play around with this, but this is a good idea, and this is a cool thing to experiment with if you just want to go through a couple of different sort of preset options, you know? Maybe you're trying to completely change the feel, the time of day. There's lots of different options in here. This one, Blue Moon, is really nice. And then you even have additional adjustments here, which you can see like faded film, which are going to, again, give you that slightly lower contrast, softer look. And you can see if you're looking at the scopes now, we're no longer clipping those highlights. We've brought that back into range. We're no longer clipping uh, the, the blacks and the shadows. And now this actually just looks, it looks pretty slick. Here is our before, not bad, but definitely contrasty, bright and kind of sharp. And here's after, and it just has a smoother look. And if you take a look, let's again go to that 200%. Here's before the LUT. And again, if you just look at those tree branches, I realize we're zoomed in 200%, but there's something very just, oh, it's just edgy. Bring back that LUT. It still has the same sharp. It still has the same detail. It's just, it's just a little softer and a little more pleasant. And gosh, doesn't that rainbow just look ever so, ever so lovely right now? I'm saying this as we're in the middle of monsoon season here in the desert. So uh, it's making me feel all the feels. All right. Now, just to kind of show you a slightly more finished version, I want to point out that in the Lumetri panel, and this is not a color tutorial, but you know, you can have layers of different color options. So we just built a completely new color, sc uh, color scheme on this Lumetri color layer, which is not named. I'm going to uh, bypass that one. So now we're back at the original. Let's go into this one here that I have called LUT and graded. So I added another Kodak LUT here. Let's go ahead and turn that on. And look at that one. And again, look at our scopes here. All right, now in range, slight amount of shadow detail. There's some very big excitement going on downstairs. Must be a soccer game. People are screaming. 
This is a, this makes me very nervous hearing that kind of screaming, but it's somebody just scored, I guess. Anybody watch? Is US soccer on right now? All right. So again, smoother, softer. Here's the before, ah, too contrasty and harsh. Here's the after, smooth, warm, lovely. And I believe I, it looks like I even added a little bit of a vignette here to just give this whole shot a little bit more drama, right? And look at the sky. Look at the pop out of the color in the sky now. Really, really lovely. And again, yes, there is a little bit of a vignette on there. Before, digital, harsh, after, beautiful. Before, after, all right? With just a couple of simple tweaks. And in this case, I also went into the basic corrections panel here where I did just a slight adjustment on contrast. Again, rolled back some of those highlights brought back a couple of the shadows, dropped the white level, didn't touch black or saturation, left it where it was, didn't adjust white balance either. I use the native white balance as shot, okay? Just gives it a nicer, smoother feel. Okay, checking it out here. All right. Yes, the Olympics, <laughs> yes, the screaming. <laughs> ah! Now that, uh, I, you know, I'm not a huge sports fan. I love, I love softball. And unfortunately we, we took, we only took the silver. I don't, I feel so stupid saying that because that stuff used to drive me nuts. One of the commentators years ago, I remember some gymnast and I remember the, the, the line was, and the crushing disappointment of silver. I mean, I get it. You also just won a, an Olympic medal. It's a weird thing. I don't know. I play the piano. You know, there's no medals for that. But anyway, uh, now that we're softball's over and Simone is out, I I'm kind of out myself. That's I like I like gymnastics and I like I like softball. That's kind of it for me. Um, but good luck to everybody in the Olympics. All right. So just a little bit about taking that digital edge off. Okay. I see no questions here. Concerns about screaming. Yeah. <laughs> you want to keep it down. By the way, this room is completely sound treated. So that's how loud. It was, all right? It's another high-pitched one. Okay, so let's move on now um, to stabilization. Oh, and just one more little before and after with regard to looks and LUTs. Talking about changing the entire feel of something. So this is, uh, again, clip I've shown many times, San Francisco, and this is, you know, like five o'clock PM. But I thought, oh, what if I wanted to give this more of a, you know, a, a richer, cooler, darker end of day look? It's got that kind of nice, golden hour-ish hue, but what if we wanted to change it up? Well, using uh, this blue intense LUT, instantly change the vibe, right? I mean, it looks like a totally different shot now. All right, super cool. But there's the before, there's the after. Once again, note the scopes, right? Before, a lot of blown out highlights. Shadow details, okay blown out highlights after we restored those highlights. Despite the dark contrast, we still have some latitude in the shadows, which you can really see if we go into 100% here and zoom in. I mean, there's like amazing detail. You can, st I don't know if that's coming through on the stream. You can still read that that says Nordstrom. So that's Union Square in San Francisco. I mean, that's a testament to the iPhone's camera. I mean, geez, you know, I'm 30 stories up there or 40 stories up. So, all right. So again, that taking that digital edginess off. Cool. Very nice. Okay. Oh, is it uh, US and the Netherlands right now? Ah, okay. Very cool. All right. So let's go on to um, stabilization. You got some handheld shaky footage. And what do you do? Well, you can do this uh, really easily in Premiere Pro with our warp stabilizer. Now, quick caveat, you know, it doesn't work for everything. What do I mean by that? Well, handheld shakiness varies, right? If you uh, have something that's, well, let's take a look at this. So this was, I've shown this many times. This is me, that's Terry in the foreground there in the black t-shirt at the big pyramid in Giza, a little over a decade ago very clearly see it's handheld. So this is when I was still a Canon shooter. This was shot with a 7D with the um, 18 to 135 non-fixed aperture kit lens. Um, still a lovely shot. 
but you know, clearly a little handheld and a little shaky looking, right? That's, that's, that's what it is. Okay. So we want to kind of remove that shakiness and just make it look a little more smooth and a little more dolly like. All right. If we go up to our effects panel, okay, which if you don't see, you can always access that via the window menu. All right. Type in warp. And you're going to see we have the warp stabilizer. Now you can either if the clip is selected in the timeline, you can double click to add it. Or you can just drag and drop, which is what I typically like to do. Go into effects controls, and you'll see that it's going to begin processing those frames. All right, um, warp stabilizer over the last couple of years has been uh, revamped and revised it's a lot faster now to process there's also less cropping involved in there. So now when I play this back, it's looking pretty smooth. It still has a slight little th this could also just be my playback here. Um, this is also again 11 year old h264 footage before it started to get really good. But if we just disable this, there's the before. Okay. So you're just seeing it has that that real wobble at the beginning right there. Let's turn the stabilization back on. Okay, again, very little cropping happening there. It just it's just way better, right? There's like a little bit of a hesitation right there. That's because I had a pretty big little kind of knock. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind. We're not going to get into all the parameters here, but obviously someone might think, okay, well, what if it's cutting off too much of my shot? Or why are you, why you said there was less cropping? Why is it cropping at all? Well, obviously, as it's figuring out where it's sort of the center is and what the good part is it's trying to preserve here, you know, as you're moving, it's having to reframe the edges. So you'll notice under borders framing, by default, it's stabilizing, cropping, and then scaling to kind of fill the edges. If I did stabilize only, take a look at this, and I'll make this full screen here, um, even with me on screen. So you see those black bars? You see how you can see the window sort of floating, right? That's showing you how it's having to move and re-stabilize the camera to give us a solid shot. So this is why it's automatically doing the crop and auto scale so that you don't get that letter box pillar box. And it's not even even, right? It's it's by design going to be uneven because I move it clearly. I was I was slightly tilted 15 degrees or so, 20 degrees to the left, and like all of my all of my shakiness was happening this way. I'm left-handed, maybe that's why. I don't know. All right. So it's doing crop and auto scale and stabilization by default, right? If you don't want the auto scale, we can just do the crop and it'll give you something like this. But note now you have a completely uh, letterboxed, pillar boxed video. Now maybe you're okay with that. Maybe you don't mind the, the, the black borders around it. I mean, it doesn't look bad. And frankly, if you were showing this on a dark monitor, dark theater, no one would, you'd be none the wiser, right? Because now with LED TVs, that black is so black, it would just look like you wouldn't notice it wasn't filling the whole screen necessarily. But if we go into crop and auto scale, now it's filling the whole screen. Okay, couple other options here, you know, you have different methods uh, for stabilization. Now subspace warp is the standard. This particular shot, these just don't do it. So but I just recommend play around with these. If you're not getting what you like, try something else. Sometimes uh, it can give you some weird artifacts. All right, case in point. Another shot here in Egypt. All right, also added a little bit of color to this one. So if I just zoom out real quickly, this is the before, this is the after. So again, a combination of LUTs as well. Oh, this one is just a LUT. I didn't even do any basic correction. So this is just a LUT, blue cold, okay? But there's already, uh, here, let me show you the shot before. So again, pretty, pretty handheld. Those little flickers, flashes that you're seeing is because as I'm zooming out, because this is a non-fixed aperture, the aperture is changing, right? That's a kit lens for you. So um, that's why you're seeing those little flickers. Those can sometimes, to be honest, uh, throw off the stabilization as well at times, not always, sometimes. Let's go ahead and turn the warp on. In this case, those little flickers flashes didn't affect it. Now, just look at this right here. Just this, these first few moments, 
I mean, it feels like Discovery Channel. It's actually quite smooth. You still see those flickers, but watch. You can actually see it's doing a little bit of a warp on the body. <laughs> like there's something unnatural in the motion right there because it is in fact sort of warping the pixels to compensate for my shakiness, all the while zooming out. So this is kind of a very challenging shot for the warp stabilizer. But in the context of me putting together a little movie about my experience at Giza, this was a lot better than this, you know, which was just kind of, just, I don't know, it just moved a lot and it was like weird pause, stop, it's not smooth, uh, zoom out again, you know. If that doesn't bother you, don't use it. If it does, check out the warp stabilizer, okay? You can also reanalyze if you make changes to this or if you cut the clip or do anything like that. Lots of cool things that you can do with this. Flickers, production values, yeah. <laughs> very good. All right. Very, very cool. Okay. You're so smooth, Santana. See what you're doing there. All right. Arakia Rahman. Hey, from Singapore. How's it going? All right. Very, very good. Okay, going to give it a try, Bruce. Very cool. All right. Moving on. God, we're really just plowing through. Oh, and here's just one more. Oh, no, this is, I showed you both. Okay. Uh, let's go into lens correction. By the way, uh, you know, if you've seen this footage before, you know, normally for these things, I make a, make a plan to shoot new stuff. Um, I don't, I just haven't been shooting a lot of video lately. So, you know, half apology for reusing footage, but uh, <laughs> the joke I would typically make now is it only works on these shots. So, but I, I won't say that. Anyway. Um, let's take a look at this. So here we have some, uh, I think this was Go, this is GoPro or drone. I can't remember exactly what this is, but you know, typical fish eyed kind of content, right? Again, when we talk about digital video, it's, it's beautiful. It's saturated. It's sharp. It's got a lot of contrast. We're not going to talk about the color here so much now, but just about that bent horizon. And you know, it never really used to bother me, but when I started doing more photography, courtesy of my good colleague, Terry White, and shot, you know, there was a period, I think there's a period, just like when iPhone introduced ultra wide, it's like, yeah, you know, ultra wide and fisheye, it's fun for 10 minutes, you know, you can't shoot everything that way. Um, or maybe 20 minutes. <laughs> maybe you love it. I love it for 10 minutes. So. When I'm looking back at this or looking at a photo like this, I'm like, oh God, that horizon's really bothering me. It never used to bother me until Terry <laughs> really pointed out, you know, well, there's ways to correct that. Oh, okay. Now it just bothers me. Well, you can correct that on video as well. So you can do it, of course, in Lightroom and Photoshop and Camera Raw. Now you can do it on video directly inside of Premiere. So let's go back to Effects and let's come over to Lens. And if I type Lens, you'll now see that we have a whole series of presets for lens correction, including very common lens distortion uh, uh, presets for popular drone cameras and GoPros, all right? So you can see you've got some DJI, Inspire, Phantom 2. It looks like we added a couple new ones in here. Oh, most definitely. I don't remember some of those being in there. Um, and it looks like we kind of stopped doing GoPro after Hero 4. These will all kind of work. Um, oh, wow, look at that. I didn't even realize Hero 3 did 4K. Wow, that one's been around a while. So we could start by just choosing a preset. All right, now I don't even remember what this one is. So let's go to something like, I think this is a this is an H2. I don't remember what that is. Oh, Hero 2. All right, so let's try, um, let me even show the Hero 2 preset. Oh, no, there it is. Let's go ahead and try the 1080 medium preset. I'm going to drag this right on there. And right away, the horizon is corrected. You can see it instantly. All right. Fixed. Done. Drag and drop. All right. Before. Bent. Nice. Cool. Maybe you kind of dig that fish-eyed aesthetic. Like I said, I can, I can get into it for about five minutes. And then I start to get, I do, I get nauseous. Like that, that right there, my equilibrium doesn't like that. Pssst, fixed. 
Now you'll see inside of lens distortion, you have curvature, vertical and horizontal decentering, vertical and horizontal prism. All right. So you have options here. You have user editable parameters as to how much you want to correct that horizon. In fact, I might even go a little more extreme on this, like I just did there. Zoom back a little bit more. Yeah, that I think I even I took it a little too far. Now it's it's bending the other way, right? <laughs> yeah, maybe right about there. 21. I backed it off a bit. I was at minus 24 before. Okay. Pretty cool. Really simple. Drag and drop. Now, common question is, oh, well, what if I shot this with whatever, 10 and a half millimeter lens on X camera? I don't see that preset. It, it doesn't really matter. Choose any of these. They all have the same parameters. Some are just designed. The preset is just designed to kind of work directly with those cameras with these settings. It's all the same parameters, though. In other words, they're all the same user editable parameters. They're just configured for those cameras. So you can really drag and drop any one of those and just tweak it from there. Case in point, this is a classic uh, piece of footage of Terry's that he shot. Uh, I want to say this is in our hotel in Finland years ago. So this is, I think, with a 10 and a half mil lens. All right, super fish-eyed, right? I mean, the whole thing is just bent. Here I'm using uh, a 1080 super, super view preset, because again, this one is pretty extremely bent and curved. Turn it on, straight lines, all right? Or I should say slightly more natural. There's still a slight curvature to it. I could probably take it a little further and smooth it out even more. Here's the reminder though, here's the before completely fish-eyed and bent, right? Here's the after, way better. <clears throat> I could continue to modify this. I don't have to though, all right? So lens correction, distortion correction, you know, this is not something you're always gonna use. As with many things, sometimes just a little bit goes a very long way. But if you are doing stuff, you know, again, with iPhone 12 or whatever, shooting ultra wide, and maybe you're getting a little bit of distortion along the edges, or you're shooting, I used to love my 16 mil prime on the on the 5D and you know it, it suffered from extreme chromatic aberration and distortion but darn it was sharp as anything um, you could use it with that right single single click fix here tweak it to your desire and keep on moving okay very cool all right Reverb mic, way more options than there used to be. Yeah, I thought so, right? Okay. <laughs> Bruce, oh really, that bad? Yes, I don't, I don't joke about my uh, ability to become nauseated. <laughs> I have extreme, I have extreme uh, motion sickness, which is hilarious because I, uh, you know, the first 13 years of this gig traveled around the world 200 days a year internationally. So I always had to take Dramamine because I get sick on planes. <laughs> Excellent job choice. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on. And I do see, thank you, Cody. So yes, uh, Tashdeed, look, if you're looking to how to approach learning Premiere and After Effects, this is a good place to start. We're in sort of episode three of Premiere Basics. Um, if you go to my channel, Jason Levine Video on YouTube, I have a whole playlist series there called How to Make Great Videos. It's 16 episodes, all chapterized, so you can skip through the parts you want. Premiere, After Effects, and Audition, and Media Encoder, really all the basics of the things you need to know. That's a good place to start. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's move on. Wow, we're plowing through. Got uh, It's 11 o'clock. Okay. So let's talk about sky replacement for video. Now, there are many different ways to mask and fix sky and do other things. And, you know, many people, if you're certainly if you're an After Effects user, that would traditionally that's kind of been my go to and you can do it with the new Roto Brush 2, quickly Roto the sky. And this shot is kind of a no brainer, right? So it's easy because there's so much contrast between the sky was so blown out at this particular angle, I mean, you can see, again, it, it might be hard to see. Now, I, I don't think there's any, yeah, there's no, this is just raw from the camera. So there's some very, I don't know if that's coming through on the stream, very small amount of 
highlight detail, you can see a little cloud kind of percolating through there. I'll bet if I bring these down even more, you'll, yeah, you can kind of see it. <laughs> I mean, really pushing the limits of the, the 7D sensor with that kit lens, okay? So all is not lost, but the reality is from that angle, that time of day, the sky just looked completely blown out, which, you know, by contrast, as we saw here, now again, this is from a, a different angle, but just so you know, I didn't fake this. That's what the sky looked like, but a lot of that is based on the aperture, again, the angle, how I was shooting. You know, you can see when I'm zoomed in here pretty tight and there were, it, there were, it was cloudy. It just wasn't a super blue sky. And as we moved further, whatever direction that was, it was even darker and grayer, okay? So again, this is just the native clip showcasing to you what it looked like, all right? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to use the HSL secondary um, tab inside of Lumetri Color to basically Photoshop style, select the sky, adjust the mask that it creates based on that selection, and then just add some color in there. Sounds maybe a little difficult or maybe not. It's not. And if you've ever done, you know, mask in color selection or color replacement in Photoshop, it's gonna feel pretty similar here. All right, and it doesn't involve rotoscoping. It doesn't involve drawing masks. You're just doing color selections with the pen, with the uh, the eyedropper. I said the, almost said the pen tool. Okay, so here we are in HSL secondaries. We're going to do this top to bottom. You know, one of the things that I love about Lumetri and about the UI design of this is that it it follows how you should use this. In other words, you know, first you start by setting the color. Now we have presets here. This white could work. I'm gonna use the eyedropper because there's actually a little bit of blue in there. Um, and then you go into refinements and then you go into correction and then you have additional, you know, correction for temperature, tint, etc. All right, so this is how we're gonna do it. So we're gonna start, I'm gonna take the eyedropper here and I'm gonna click into what I, you know, I believe is sort of the, the neutral whitest point of that sky, all right? Now, if I go on and turn on the mask, not a super great mask. <laughs> so we're gonna need to make adjustments to the hue, all right? So we have HSL, hue, saturation, luminance, which I'm probably ha going to have to expand almost all the way, all right? And if I see those little blocky pixels, that means that I'm missing some, some stuff. Now, again, older older DSLR footage, 8-bit, if this were 422, 422 versus 420, and a higher bit rate, this mask probably would have worked better. So we've got a couple things fighting against us. We can still make a lovely correction here. All right, we're also going to adjust the range of the saturation because you can see I've got some pixelated blockiness mess here. So let's adjust the saturation range and make sure we're getting these edges nice and smooth. Actually looks really good. Luminance seems to be pretty good. All right, now if I pull it out too far, you can see now it's starting to bring back in some of the color. We don't want any of that. So let's just take this right to the edge here. Now, again, we don't wanna defeat any of that brightness there. So we're gonna find the sweet spot, which is somewhere right around here, all right? So there's our mask. Pretty darn good mask. Okay, now, as with Photoshop, when I'm making selections. Now, I don't always do this, but sometimes, and especially for this, because the camera is moving, it's not still, little bit of blur, maybe. There's, there's no real noise here. Maybe there's a little bit of color noise, actually. This makes me think of Select and Mask in Photoshop. That's not gonna denoise color, unfortunately. But adding just a little bit of a blur, I'm gonna do like 0.5 pixel blur, is just going to take, again, a little bit of that edge off, even though it's done a really good job, okay? Let's go out of the mask here, and now we're going to go into correction, all right? So first, I'm simply going to adjust the temperature and add some blue in there, all right? And then I'm going to adjust the contrast a little bit. Give it a little more saturation. Now I'm gonna work with this global color adjustment here. Let's go into the blues there. I kind of darken the contrast of that. Again, you have a couple options here where you can go into shadows, midtones, highlights, or do this with a single control like that, okay? 
Maybe not my finest attempt, maybe D sharpen a little bit. Again, take a little bit of that edging off there. Okay. Move it into place. Take a look. Blue sky. All right. Notice even, I love it now. Now you're even getting a little more detail in that cloud. Now, mind you, we haven't even done any basic corrections. So if we do further adjustments to this, we can probably get it even better. All right. Here was the before, though, completely blown out. Not the sky I wanted. Not happy about that. Here's the after. It was a lovely day. And because this is sort of, you know, shifting, changing organically, you get kind of, you can still see the sun was coming from that direction. So it has a slightly different hue and you're seeing the brightness differences and you're not even seeing any noise. Really, really nice. Now I did another version of this. Let's see if this one's even better. Nah, it's basically the same, All right? I just did another take of this to see if I could get it a little bit more blue, but it looks very natural and I'm very happy with this. So this is a quick and easy way, all right, to replace sky. Now, you know, obviously, if you're trying to do this in a really complex shot, I mean, in terms of masking difficulty, I'd say this is this is not super difficult, right? Because we're dealing with hard edge surfaces, you know, there's no hair, there's no trees, <laughs> no twigs, we're dealing with massive, massive rock formations. So the lines are pretty discreet. It's, you know, it's not going to be super challenging to get a good mask without artifacts. Your mileage may vary, but this is a really quick and easy way if you just want to bring back, even if it's a little, maybe you shot on one day and it was just a little bit overcast or not quite as cloudy or the other direction. Maybe you want to kind of darken it, add a bit more drama, do something else. You can do that real quickly with HSL secondaries. Okay, cool. A sweet look without a ton of work. Thank you very much, Mike. I would, I would agree. All right. Okay. Michael Vandal, uh, the problem with effects is to find the one you're looking for, in particular if using another language. Uh, is there a way to stick to English names for effects? You know, that's actually a great question, Mike. A little off topic here, but let me just, I can comment a little bit on that in terms of using the English terms. There are some terms that internationally are English, right, for certain effects and processes and things. That being said, there are also certain regions of the world where based on particular state country laws, things have to be translated if they're coming from uh, an international entity. Um, I believe France is one of those locations where there may be exception for some things that are just ubiquitous in terms of this is what it's called. You know, there is no translation. But unfortunately, for a lot of the technical terms in different regions, they, they, they're, I don't know, I don't know why I just know they have to be translated. So this is why you see, th sometimes it's often difficult because you're looking for, you know, whatever, maybe it's not warp, but it could be something like that. And the translation doesn't really mean warp, it means skew or bend. I know I, I can I can see how that would cause a lot of frustration and I do apologize. This is actually why I've never really retained a lot of keyboard shortcuts. And the reason for that is back in the day when we used to demo internationally, many of you who've known me for years, you'll know, I used to do this. When we would go to Germany, I'd be demoing in the German software. Now I speak a little German, but I, I shouldn't have been using German software. The reason I was doing it though was because the menu locations of everything was exactly the same. So I got so used to, like, I know it's this, you know, third menu from the bottom, the top one is file export media. I didn't need to search for stuff. So that made it easier for me to like navigate through the menus and things that doesn't necessarily help with effects, I realize, but that's actually how I sort of got around that. Because yes, I remember there was one in particular, I think it's drop shadow. And I can't remember if it's in the Japanese version or maybe it's in the Spanish version. The translation is just, or maybe it's the Dutch version. The translation is just weird. Like how you translate drop shadow. It's just a totally different word in that language. So I feel you. I wish there were an easier way. Um, I don't have one, unfortunately. All right. That being said, great. Okay. Let's move on. What's next? Audio. Very cool. Okay. 
So I'm going to uh, just shift things around here for a second. I'm going to put on my headphones so I can hear. All right. Now I realize we'll have to see. Hopefully you'll be able to hear this stuff. Okay. So this is going to involve uh, introducing a little bit of audition into uh, into the mix, but this is something which, if you record, you know, on, well, anyone can encounter this because I, I hear and see this all the time. I mean, heck, it even happens during live streams. But you know, you have a moment where if you're not using some kind of compressor or volume leveler on the input before you capture your audio, it's very possible that you may encounter a momentary digital pop or click or some kind of momentary distortion. And these things can not only be distracting, but they can kind of just, they can ruin a moment, especially if it's in like in a critical part of an interview like this one here. So this is one I did years ago with uh, the president and CEO of the Diamondbacks organization, Derek Hall, who's kind enough to let me come in and interview him for this special video we were doing. And uh, here he's talking about um, this uh, this man named Joe Garagiola, who was a a commentator and, and 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 ball player and very famous famous dude and kind of an Arizona legend. Uh, he lived here in the latter years of his life and did a lot of the commentating for the Diamondbacks. And here he's talking about how at one point Joe even uh, uh, had the pleasure of hosting the Tonight Show when Johnny Carson was out of town. I and mean, this is how famous Joe Garagiola was in the in the sixties. And uh, just for a second, so let's take a listen and see if we can hear it, all right? Him as just... All right, kind of wind forward here. This time uh, on The Tonight Show, filling in for Johnny Carson and actually interviewing the Beatles. Okay, so he says, actually, you can hear there's this like, like this crunchy, it just gets real crunchy for a moment. Johnny Carson and actually interviewing the Beatles. Johnny Carson and actually, actually interviewing the Beatles. Johnny Carson and actually interviewing the Beatles. Okay. I mean, here's a guy who got to interview Paul McCartney and John Lennon uh, on the couch. Uh, on the couch. Uh, on the couch. Okay. Couch. You can hear this like, it just gets crunchy. All right. Now, just looking at the waveform here in Premiere, I can make this full screen. I mean, it looks a little flat top to me there, but the, you know, these waveforms, this doesn't really tell me anything. I need, I need a little more analysis here. So from Premiere Pro, I'm going to right click on this clip and choose to edit the clip in Adobe Audition. And when I do that, it's going to perform a render and replace, okay? It's going to bring that audio into Audition. And now I can use all of the tools in Audition to analyze and process this. Sorry, my UI wasn't configured. So as with all things, I tend to, you know, first just kind of take a look at the audio. And I can see that it's definitely, there's, there's something going on here. And go back in time. And hear what life was did in St. Louis. Best friends with Yogi Berra. All right. Best part about it, he's trying to change lives. All right. So now let me see here. Did this? Did these go matters? back in time? Talk to him. Go back in time. And go back in time. And go back in time. That's another one. Another little clip section. Poor right kid in St. Louis. Best friends with Yogi Berra. All right. Oh, these are all clip sections. Best friends with Yogi Berra. Perfect. I always have told this story how I. I uh, I was the ro I was the mo roving cameraman, camera person, and uh, I had my I had a, an audio person working with me as well. And I remember telling them, and I recorded this live into Audition. So I'm like, so listen, you're hearing the audio, you're seeing the waveform, you can see the level. Just be careful of distortion. They were looking at Audition and not seeing any clipping lights because the signal output from the the sound device. Uh, was below zero, but the the input on the device itself was going into the red, and that's why we were encountering those little clipped sections. So under the diagnostics panel, which I may need to move up here, again you can find this under diagnostics here. We're going to go into the D clipper, okay, and we're going to choose restore normal, and I'm going to scan, all right. And when I do that, it's now going to tell me what it has found. And if we take a look here, it has detected nothing major, just 91 clipped areas. Now, you might say, well, that's not even that bad. I can't even hear it on the stream. What are you even talking about? All right, look, these are little, short, transient peaks of distortion. Maybe it's not going to bother anybody. Maybe by the time this gets edited and exported and uploaded that there's so much degradation 
that, you know, by the time it makes its way to YouTube, eh, you don't really hear it. And if you put music behind it, you're probably not really going to notice. But if you're like me, and certainly if you're in the production and there's no music yet, and you're just listening to audio, those little distortion pieces, it's, it's, it, you just shouldn't leave them there, right? That's, that's just not a pro move. And it would probably get bounced from a broadcaster if it were airing like on a proper network. So let's go into repair all, all right? Now what you're going to see, or what you may have just seen, is that the waveform changed. Let's undo this, all right? So take a look at what this looks like. Let's redo it. And notice how suddenly the waveform got larger. What does that mean? It means that it has now reconfigured the transient that first attack of his voice there, and it's restored, instead of having this flat top clip signal, it's restored the dynamic range of that section, okay? Now, if I were to run our amplitude statistics on this, I can tell you right now that it's definitely causing a problem because it's telling us that this is now 15 decibels above zero, all right? And we have a lot of clipped samples. But wait, I thought you just fixed that. Well, I did. This is a very long technical rant. I'm going to try and keep it short. Audition is always working in 32-bit float. So if we liken this to something like working in RAW versus JPEG, when you work in 32-bit float, you have more dynamic range than if you're working in 16-bit or 24-bit. But that dynamic range extension is largely for processing effects. So what happens is it fixes that clip, and by doing so and reconfiguring the waveform, it's now exceeded zero decibels, which technically in a digital audio domain can't happen. But in the pre, sort of in the production process, it can. So instead of doing the process of restore normal, I'm going to choose restore lightly clipped, which will do the same thing. It's going to repair those clip sections, but it's also going to perform in attenuation, meaning that it's going to take those restored peaks and then take the overall level of everything and drop it down. So it fixes the distortion and then it also prevents additional distortion. So now if we take a listen to this and go back in time and here, and I'm even going to make this louder for you just so you can hear that it's nice and clean, no click, no crackle and go back in time and hear what life was like for him. This guy that grew up, poor kid in St. Louis, best friends with. All right, let's undo. Here's the before. And go back in time and hear what life was like for him. This guy that grew up, poor kid in St. Louis, best friends. All right. And go back and go back and go back. Let's redo. Just make it a little bit louder. Just for the stream. And go back and go back and go back and go back. Now, if you're not in headphones, you're probably not hearing that. If you are in headphones, hopefully you are hearing it. You can't hear it because of the stream. Here's what your face should be doing right now. Yeah. It's amazing. Now, like all things like this, does this work on everything? No. Will this work on you went to the, your first concert of the post pandemic era and you recorded your favorite band with your phone, right? And uh, you were 20 feet from the main speaker. So the whole thing is distorted. Will it fix that? 100% not. No, it will not. This is designed to work with short attack transients, meaning something like friend, boy, whatever, like just something that momentarily causes it to click or distort up to around 12 decibels even, it can do a very, very good job. If you have one minute of continuously distorted content, it's not going to work. It's not going to do it. That's not what this is designed for. So, but for dialogue, right, that moment like, hey, I'm talking to you, you know, and the, the, like the hey was like too loud, but the energy was right and everything. The take was perfect. To quote my good friend, Carrie O'Brien, this can save your bacon. All right. Amazeballs. Thank you, Reverb Mike. <laughs> All right. Very cool. <laughs> and Cody's singing. I'm missing it. All right. Very cool. Oh, and Umicorn is confirming the Dutch translation of stuff is, yeah, I mean, listen, I've, ah, uh, that, Tom, 
Tom, uh, I think you're right. I think it is, perhaps it's in Dutch too. No, but that actually seems kind of right. Anyway, I can't remember which language it was, but yes, there are certain things that they, they just, you know, they get lost in translation, right? Okay. All right. We got five more minutes. So that's restoring digital clipping. Oh, and by the way, once you do that. And, and go back in time and hear what life was like for him. Right. When I save this, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to replace the, the media there. And I go back to Premiere, it updates in Premiere's timeline. Yes. So we did the fix over there. Come back over here. It's restored. All right. Actually, I can, I can in fact, just do it. I think we'll be in different locations, but that's okay. So I saved that. Let's close it. You'll see the waveform now kind of update visually real quickly. Take a look. It's real fast. Blink. All right. It's fixed. You know, on The Tonight Show, it's fun to hear those stories. I have to interview Paul McCartney and John Lennon uh, on the couch. You know, on The Tonight Show, it's fun to hear those stories. Like, perfect, beautiful, no distortion. And to be able to sit down and, and talk to him and, and go back in time and hear what life was like for him. This guy that grew up, a poor kid, in St. Louis. Right? God, yeah. Amazing. By the way, this saved my bacon because... This is a big deal. Like, this is a heavy hitter right here. No pun intended. <laughs> Baseball illusion. I'm not going to get a second chance to do this interview because my sound guy didn't pay attention to the levels. That's on me. That's my neck. So I had to fix it. This fixed it. Saved the day. Nobody ever knew. Client was like, sounds brilliant. I'm like, I know. <laughs> yes. Okay. Last two things we're going to cover here. All right. Plosives. So let's do it. All right. Very commonly encountered. This is where you have that burst of air that just momentarily distorts things. In fact, I think we're going to end on plosives. We're not going to have enough time for noise. You can cover that in one of my other uh, training videos. All right. Um, let's see. All right. Let's take a listen to a plosive. Premiere Pro, Premiere Pro, Premiere Pro, Premiere Pro, Premiere Pro, Premiere Pro. Now again, you might need headphones for this, or if you've got a nice little sub, you're gonna hear that second Pro. Premiere Pro, Premiere Pro. Sounds like I've got a TR-808 kick on there. And then here. Sequenced, sequenced, sequenced. So quence, because the qu sound. I did this intentionally. Well, and actually this one, I don't know but I'm doing it on a, on a large diaphragm condenser, very close to my mouth, no pop filter. So the qu is just a lot of air and it caused that little thud. Quince, 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 quince. Which is annoying, right? Not cool, not pro. How do we fix that? Okay. So when you zoom in, when you look at a waveform that has a plosive. Pro, 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 pro. I mean, you can see this little wiggly bit right there. It looks wrong. Now, sometimes it extends into the uh, into the vowel as well. So I'm going to make a selection like that. Go up to Effects, Filter, FFT Filter, where we have a preset called Kill the Mic Rumble. Click Apply. And now when I play it back. Pro. Premiere Pro. Premiere Pro. Premiere Pro. Undo. Premiere Pro. Premiere Pro. Redo. Premiere Pro. Brilliant. Next one. Sequence. Quent. 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 Sequence. All right. We can make a beat out of this. Quent. 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 All right. Not good. Quent. 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 Same thing. Repeat FFT filter. Kill the mic rumble. Apply. Play. Sequence. 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 Before, sequenced, 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 after, sequenced, sequenced, done. Okay? We are going to get time for noise reduction. Now, you can do this on the Premiere side or you can do it on the Edition side. Now, you might not hear a lot of noise in this, all right? I don't know if that's going to come through on the stream at all. I'm going to increase the volume. So that's actually what's going on in the background. Now, obviously, it's 30 dB quieter, but that's going throughout this whole voiceover. So if I go up to Effects, Noise Reduction, Denoise, we have this new, very simple to use denoiser. Basically, just choose where 
what frequency the noise lives in, low, medium, high, or a combination thereof, and you've got one slider to take it out. I'm going to use the default, which is the process on all frequencies. We can start playing back. And Adobe Audition CC, you can seamlessly move files from the Premiere Pro sequence directly into Audition and correct them. And Adobe Audition CC, you can seamlessly move files from the Premiere Pro sequence directly into Audition and correct them. OK. You just listen for how much noise reduction you want. All right. That sounded pretty good. That's actually pretty extreme. I'm trying to be a, a little more extreme for the stream. All right. And it's just going to take that noise out of there. And Adobe Audition CC, you sequence directly into Audition and correct them. All right. And just make it that much cleaner. OK. So the denoiser is available under noise reduction. OK. There's also de reverb, but unfortunately, we don't have time for that, friends. We've got the daily creative challenge for Illustrator coming up next. So until next time, have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world, and we will see you again. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. Take care. Bye bye.